In this next section on spatial exploratory data analysis, I'm going to talk about uh, methods for spatial interpolation. So the objective of interpolation is you have, uh, again, uh, geospatial data, so x, y locations with some attribute z associated with them, and you're often trying to make a grid, uh, a gridded map or a raster map or, or some other interpolated map you're predicting values at specific locations uh, from the points that you already have. And I'm going to go through, you know, progressively increasingly complicated or, or sophisticated ways of doing that. Uh, so the simplest way of interpolation is just linear interpolation. That works particularly well if your data is already on a grid. Uh, you're just, you know, just interpolating linearly between two points. So imagine I've got, uh, uh, Anyway, take the two points on the upper end, and here I, uh, in this space, I, you know, I've assigned that a one and a 0.5, and I just interpolate linearly between those. Uh, so, you know, I just draw a line between them and, and you know, uh, yeah, fill in the points according to the line that connects those, the, the data that connects those two points. I can do that on the, the lower axis, uh, and then uh, for any, you know, pair of points uh, in the y direction, I can linearly interpolate between them. And actually, if I'd done that in the other order, if I'd interpolated along the y-axis and then interpolated along the x-axis, I would have gotten the same result because this is just, uh, the interpolation is just a linear combination of, of the x and the y-axis. So it, it works either direction. And here we're seeing, you know, do with just four data points, uh, the ability to interpolate across that whole surface. Uh, yeah, we have no idea well, how well it's doing because we have no validation points, but it's, a, it's definitely the simplest form of interpolation and it works particularly well with regularly spaced data. It gets uh, definitely uh, more complex with irregularly spaced data. Uh, moving on, uh, this linear interpolation is, is uh, nice and, and simple, uh, but it doesn't always guarantee that adjacent uh, grid cells are going to go together smoothly. So there's often you know, also the idea of uh, things like bicubic interpolations, which are you know, often smoothing a little bit more by using a, a cubic analog to the linear interpolation. So you're fitting a cubic function across those uh, you know, the four points and, and uh, interpolating across them. Uh, other options are things like uh, a, a nearest neighbor interpolation, which really literally just says assign uh, any point the value of, uh, associated with whatever is the closest point to it. Uh, nearest neighbors are uh, related to uh, geometric concepts such as tes tessellation and Voronoi diagrams. And so this figure uh, in the right is an example of a uh, of a tessellation or you know Voronoi diagram, basically the same thing, where I've assigned, you know, I've given a color to the attribute value and assigned each point the value uh, to its nearest neighbor. So, you know, the con construction of these diagrams you can kind of see. If I pick two points, you know, there's a midpoint between them, and then there's a, a tangent uh, line to that midpoint, and so uh, that's how the tessellation is is done is it, you know between any two points you know we split at the midpoint uh, there's a, a, a perpendicular line to the line connecting them and then we you know, fill in every value every point in that grid cell with that value at this point I, you know i assign colors randomly so it kind of emphasizes um, where the the each of these uh, nearest neighbor kind of uh, uh, polygons are. Uh, but if, if points near each other had similar values, you would actually would see a, a much more smooth surface. Uh, and then uh, a similar concept is a, a triangular irregular network or a TIN where I'm, you know, using points as, as vertices and connecting them uh, to the, the um, connecting them with a set of triangles that does not have any triangle uh, bisecting another 
triangle. So you, know, you don't have one triangle splitting another in, in, in part. Um, moving on, you know, one of the things that is limiting about uh, these nearest neighbors in, in linear and cubic interpolation methods and in triangular networks is that uh, any inference that they're making is only using the nearest point to it, uh, the nearest points to it. So in a linear interpolation, you're just interpolating between the two nearest points. And points outside of, you know, beyond those two nearest points don't have any impact on your inference. Um, and if you have a, you know, a bunch of points in an area, you, sh you might intuitively think, well, um, I want to use multiple points within a region you know, account for some of the noise between them, average that out a bit, smooth it out a bit. Um, and so um, that leads us to uh, approaches such as inverse distance weighting. And so the idea of inverse distance weighting is that we uh, are calculating a weighted average uh, according to uh, uh, between the values and points. We're weighting uh, points relative to their distance. And so, you know, all, all forms of inverse distance weighting are just special cases of, of weighting averages where the, depending on how the weights are calculated. Um, for really irregular data, we might want to use, you know, the n nearest point or a fixed radius search. So, you know, you, know, you don't have to calculate uh, the weights out to you know, infinite distances with infinitesimally small weights, you can truncate that uh, at some radius or some number of points. Uh, and the key in the inverse distance weighting point, weighting approaches really boils down to, you know, how you calculate those weights. So you need some way of weighting points as a function of distance. Um, and so, you know, the, the simplest version of that is just weighting by one over distance. So if our weight is one over distance, then the value at any location uh, is just the sum of the weights times the attribute divided by uh, the sum of the possible weights. So if I pick any arbitrary point in space, I can calculate the distance from that point in space to all the other points, possibly truncating those uh, based on number of points or, or radius uh, or, or not. You know, you know, once once you get far enough out, you know, you aren't really sensitive to that because things, you know, very far in the tails have very low weight. Um, so if some, uh, you know, calculating over the points and assigning those weights, and you know, things nearby count more, things far away count less. Um, yeah, there are all, alternatives to uh, just the the simple inverse distance weighted approach such as you know one over d squared um, so some of the the pros and cons here you know inverse distance weight is, is simple uh, it, it unlike the interpolation like I said the, the pro is that it's involving more points than just the um, nearest neighbor gives you an, a, you know a nice smoother interpolation uh, you're it's kind of less sensitive to some of the the noise in data because you're averaging over data points. So those are some of the positives. Uh, some of the negatives about uh, inverse distance weighting approaches uh, is this choice of weighting function seems you know, somewhat arbitrary and not necessarily connected to the properties of the data. So nothing about the, you know, the, the spatial scales of, of correlation is used in this approach is just, you know, one over d squared or over one over d or, you know, one over d cubed. You know, there's just some weight that's applied. So you're not using information about the, the structure and the data to choose the, the weighting. Uh, it also has no way of accounting for any sort of errors in interpolation. So if I interpolate to a point really far away from any other points, uh, the interpolation ends up just as confident about that point as it does, you know, interpolating a point, you know, very close to nearby points because there's not uh, any sort of error propagation. Uh, but intuitively points further away from known, known points should be more uncertain. 
uh, but this is a simple analytical calculation, not a, really a statistical model. Um, and then I also wanted to, to kind of hear, kind of talk explicitly about uh, the difference between interpolation and smoothing, because we talked earlier about spatial smoothing approaches, um, and now we're talking, which are often used to fill in a map. Now we're talking about interpolation approaches used to fill in a map. What's the difference between interpolation and smoothing? Uh, well, an interpolator, uh, the key point is an interpolation uh, is going to pass through the data exactly at the data point. So, you know, if I'm interpolating between points, uh, you know, when I get to, to a point, it goes, the interpolation goes to that point. Uh, while a smoother, you know, it, it, you know, if I fit a polynomial to some data, it's not going to go through every point in the data. It's going to go, um, you know, it'll leave some residual error uh, between the model and the data. So a, a true interpolator uh, has zero residuals uh, while smoothing is separating the trend and the residuals. So the final uh, form of interpolation I wanted to, to talk about, and then in, in later lectures we'll, we'll follow up with how we actually implement, uh, is this idea of Krieging. And, and Krieging is very similar to uh, our, our inverse distance weighting approaches in that we are uh, you know, weighting points according to their distances uh, from other points. But the key, the key insight of the Krieging approaches, the key uh, ad advancement uh, is that the interpolation is that, that spatial weighting is based on the spatial autocorrelation function. Uh, actually, literally, it's based on the variogram. Uh, so you're you're using spatial autocorrelation to provide weights. Um, so it, you know, first it requires that we fit that autocorrelation model uh, to a variogram or or correlogram so that we can calculate the weight analytically as a function of distance. Uh, but then it provides a way of weighting those points as a function of of correlation. So if, if the correlation uh, between points drops off very quickly, then the weighting will drop off very quickly. If the correlation between co points drops off very slowly, it'll drop off very slowly. If, if, the, if the correlation, you know, drops off according to some, you know, funky shape that has, you know, bumps in it, you know, the, the, the interpolation will acknowledge that in the weighting. Uh, the other thing that's really important about uh, Krieging is that since it's based on autocorrelation and thus based on ultimately based on the spatial covariance matrix, it actually provides a mechanism of estimating the interpolation error. So every point we interpolate to doesn't just have an estimated mean associated with it, it's also gonna have an estimated uh, uh, variance, which is, is really nice. It will lead to that uh, desired quality that points that are far away from each other, uh, in, interpolation to points that are far from any measurements will have more uncertainty than interpolation to points that are, are nearby. Uh, so that kind of wraps up my introduction of, of exploratory methods uh, for spatial data analysis. Uh, I'm gonna next dive into uh, kind of how we actually go about uh, implementing a, si a simple uh, Krieging approach in R. Note, I will say at this stage, I'm still going to consider that implementation of Krieging as part of exploratory data analysis, but it's going to very logically build us towards our following lectures on actually building spatial covariance matrices in data models.